Cool. So welcome guys to the Macros Bodybuilding and Powerlifting Podcast. I am very happy to have a special guest, Brad Schoenfeld, here with us today. I've actually met Brad twice as he came to the UK, first on his own uh, for a seminar with Shredded by Science and then again with the Personal Trainer Collective where he came across with a bunch of other fitness professionals and in both great. Uh, I love seeing Brad's work, I love seeing him present and he's a real credit to the industry and especially for powerlifters and bodybuilders who muscle size is a huge part of our success. So Brad Schoenfeld, obviously, if you haven't heard of him, is known as the muscle hypertrophy expert and you, I'm sure you've read at least his books, hopefully. So recently came out with basically an encyclopedia for muscle hypertrophy, which I've got and it's an excellent resource. I absolutely love it. He also has some female books, also the Max Muscle Plan, which is a fantastic book, which I got years ago. And of course, kind of goes around the world presenting. And we were just chatting how you've recently kind of have been, well, you've been all over the world recently and you're soon off to present again. So uh, how are you doing, Brad? How's everything going? I'm doing great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Steve. And I should have said, also were a bodybuilder in the past that like you've competed and you did really well didn't you yeah so i competed as a natural bodybuilder uh won my class uh, several times i also won a mixed pairs i uh, did a mixed pairs with the uh, fellow female competitor a while ago uh so yeah i did my competition days and uh, decided that was it and uh, now pursue education and, and research uh so a different track now yeah i mean I don't think I'd be able to do the kind of research you're doing and do a competition diet. I think that would be like, right, I have to take a year off from that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. A, it's a uh, onerous uh, endeavor. People don't realize how much effort goes into competing. It's not just lifting and doing some diet. I mean, there's posing. It's, it's a very, to do it properly is, is really uh, onerous. Yeah, there's a lot to it. So today we're going to help people out come and tackle what I had thought of as people might think of them as myths, but you rightly pointed out they're misconceptions really because there aren't real myths out there necessarily. Uh, so we're going to go through some of these and help people kind of understand kind of the, the I'm going to call it the righteous path to hypertrophy, the path they want to be looking to follow. Um, and no doubt they can also get this path via your book. So I would, I'm going to put a sneaky plug in for you there because I do think they're excellent resources. And if they have kind of listen to this and they want a taster, they want more, then that's where they want to dive into the science. So if we step into the first kind of misconception of high intensity training. So this was first kind of massively popularized that I saw by Mike Mensah. And this is from my understanding kind of, you don't do much volume as it were, you do mainly kind of one very intense set. And obviously that single set is a, is a big hypertrophic stimulus, but as we're seeing in the research, volume becoming pretty key towards kind of maximal muscle growth. Is that right, Brad? Yeah, and that actually, the high intensity training was popularized by Arthur Jones, who was the inventor of Nautilus equipment mm -hmm. uh, before Menser and uh, others had been uh, disciples of Arthur Jones and Menser picked up on it. But yeah, so I, um, it's actually been a, a very, it's been a hobby horse of mine, a topic that I've uh, really taken an interest in, in studying, and we've carried out now a, a very comprehensive meta analysis, which was just published on the topic. So, bottom line, uh, the if you want kind of the lowdown on it, you can make very good gains. There's no question that a high intensity routine, a one set to failure type routine, can promote extensive uh, gains in, in muscle mass. I will say that the evidence is compelling, and I would say overwhelming, that to maximize muscle growth, you need to have a higher volume. Now, when it starts getting into how much more, that's where the nuances of exercise science come in. And there is no cookie cutter. People always want that magic number of sets or magic number of reps, whatever it is. And that there's no such thing as that because it really is highly individual. There's, uh, I can provide guidelines, which I will, but there's a genetic component. There's lifestyle factors that enter into it. And uh, often, as I'll, I'll talk about a little, it's not one way to do it uh, forever. It there might be better ways to go about it, structuring it in kind of a, an undulating fashion. So what I'll say is, is that the recent meta analysis we did showed a clear dose response relationship, meaning that as volume went up, so did the, uh, the corresponding hypertrophy. So five sets or, or four sets or less 
uh, per muscle per week. And we, we looked at it in terms of training a muscle group, per, uh, how many times per muscle per week. Uh, four times per week or less uh, resulted in about 5% growth, went up to around 7% growth between five to nine sets uh, per muscle per week. And then 10 plus uh, sets per week was about 10% muscle growth. And we could not find, the literature was not robust enough to get any detail beyond those, beyond 10 sets per week. Uh, so we don't know at what point you might hit a threshold on an average basis. So in putting that into practical terms, you get almost double the amount of growth by doing 10 sets per muscle per week as you do for less than five sets per week. Uh, so that said, does that mean that if you keep doing 10 sets, let's say we would just throw 10 sets out, is that optimal? Would maybe 15 be optimal? Or would maybe um, undulating the volume over time? And that's now a concept that I, I look to study in the future where what we do know is that training with consistently high volumes over time tends to result in overtraining and that's going to have a negative effect. But we do know that short, you can push yourself very hard for short periods of time without overtraining and thus maybe achieve a super compensatory response. And that to me is, is the way I program. I look to, to have this in a kind of a wave-like pattern where you periodize and go from uh, a lower type volume. I, when that's ambiguous too. So lower does not necessarily mean one set or three sets, but you, you base this on the individual. So you, you get uh, one lower, then you go a little higher, and then you finish up with a very high or what would be considered very high for that individual and then come back down. So it's in this wave-like pattern where you try to push you uh, undulate it up so that you push them towards kind of a cliff without going over the cliff and then pull back from that cliff. And it's a successive periods of, of doing that, uh, in my opinion, based not only on research, but the research is very limited on it, but certainly in terms of practical experience. And that's what we have to refer to when uh, there's really no consistent literature. It certainly has a strong rationale, logical basis behind it. And um, again, the important thing to remember is, is that when I throw, I remember when the a study throws out a, uh, a figure like 10 sets per week uh, is better, that's an average. We have to remember that those are mean numbers and that some respond better to somewhat lower and some are going to respond better to somewhat higher. And that's where being intuitive comes in and you have to then experiment. And uh, that's N equals one is, is an important uh, important gauge to use, but only after you use research as, as a basis, as a guideline. Fantastic. And I, yeah, I really like that in terms of the fact it's so individual because people will look at that 10 sets and I even actually wrote a status recently about volume and they're like, oh, 10 sets is kind of the golden zone. And I was like, well, maybe a minimum of 10 sets according to this average, because uh, we're looking at every percentage increase. It's not kind of we're not seeing diminishing returns at all yet. We're seeing kind of the good returns. So it could, like you said, be 15 sets. Do you think there is like, do you think 15 sets could be the kind of the point at which if you go much higher, the gains are going to start detracting? Again, I, I would hypothesize. So this is now where I can't go on specifically on data, but mm -hmm. we, there were a few studies that were carried out that did show consistent uh, that there was greater increases as you kept going up the chain. Uh, certainly, they're going to start to level off as to how much uh, they are. And, and of course, time efficiency can be a, an important factor there, too. So if I told you that you training four hours a day was better than one, but that the overall increase is going to be a half percent muscle, well, if you're a bodybuilder, maybe that's worth it. If you're an executive in a corporation or you have a regular job, it's probably not going to be worth it. And then again, remember that studies are short term in nature. They tend to be eight weeks, 10 weeks, maybe 12 weeks. Uh, if you kept doing that over a year, would you keep seeing that? Or would there be not only diminishing returns, could that push you to overtraining? These are all things that you can't really uh, um, extrapolate from the literature. And what, mm -hmm. what I can say is, is that there, it might be that doing uh, even less than 10 sets for a month, usually 10 is kind of where I start my basis at. But for some people, maybe they're doing six sets per muscle, and then they gravitate up to 12 and then to 18. So for someone that might be good, then another might, might be 10, 15, 20. Another one might be 12, 18, 25. These are all things that you have to play around with. And uh, that's where experimentation really is the only way to go. Because again, in a research study, you're going to have a plot. If you plot the results, and when I do my studies, 
I'm going to have people across the spectrum. It's, it's not like everyone is at that 10%. There's people that are under and there are people that are over. So how much of that is due to the volume? How much of that might be due to confounding factors, uh, lifestyle factors at the time, stress levels? So much goes into this in, in an applied science that it's very difficult to provide. I can provide general guidelines uh, through my research and through the literature, but to, to provide a be-all, end-all is, is just not possible. And that people look for that from research and they are, that's where extrapolating from research is, is incorrect. When people take research, and I, one thing I always do want to point out is that um, an, an astute scientist uses research as a guideline, but an evidence-based, good evidence-based practitioner then uses his personal expertise and the needs and abilities of, of the individual to formulate proper opinions. You cannot just look at the research and say, all right, research says 10 sets uh, per muscle per week or 15 sets per muscle per week or whatever it is, and that's what the gold standard is. That is not, research will never tell you that in an applied science. Fantastic. Yeah, I definitely agree with my own clients in that I've had them, and you have to look at how they're performing and they're, they're, you use that kind of research that you've provided as a great baseline and then you can almost use yourself as a research study. That's and it. on that note, what, what kind of markers do you look for to see how kind of to respond, whether it's enough volume, whether it's enough for kind of the audience so they can kind of take something away and kind of think, oh, maybe I can use more because I'm actually, my performance is increasing or whatever markers you might use, Brad. Yeah, well, one of the things that I think is important, once you become overtrained, it's you, you then it's you it's very difficult then to fall back. Then you've you've gone too far. So I always take a more cautious approach and again try to do it in smaller increments. So I, I earn the side of caution. And what I would say is that you do you take let's say a three month cycle, see how you do, and then uh, you you always want to gauge based upon a number one performance. Do you start seeing declines in performance? And also gauging on uh, how the person feels. Or if you're doing it on yourself, how are you feeling? Are you starting to lose your, your zest to train? That's a, generally a clear sign that overtraining is starting to set in. You want to pull back before that happens. So I, I, what I would say is that you see that over a three-month period, then you assess, reassess, and take into account performance and your, how you felt, and then adjust accordingly in the next cycle. Cool. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, those are some of the things I program for myself and for my clients kind of, yeah, getting that feedback. How are you feeling? Is your motivation to train high? Are you feeling exhausted all the time? How's your performance week on week? Is it improving? Is it stagnating? Is it a set, like, is it worse even? And yeah, then you kind of use that data and then you are your own research study and you're doing tests on yourself, which is really cool. Yeah, you take the research and then you're at N equals one after that. Brilliant. And um, on a related note, because we've touched on it now, in that we, I hear people sometimes say deloads aren't required or there's never a time to pull back. And obviously we've talked about overtraining. Kind of, not that, that it's a myth necessarily that you don't need deloads, but do you want to kind of go over the basis behind deloads and kind of the super compensation effect and potentially like functional overreaching, those sort of things? Yeah, deloads are basically uh, short periods of reduced training intensity and or volume or both um, where that are designed to uh, rejuvenate and restore a person's recovery, uh, so to really to enhance recovery. Are they required? Um, if you're training really hard, my belief is they are. If you're constantly training below threshold, you never need a deload period. But if you're pushing yourself like I talked about, uh, where you're in different ways, whether it's through higher intensity levels, reduced rest intervals, greater volumes, greater frequencies, whatever it is, if you're pushing yourself really hard, uh, it, it behooves you to ensure that you uh, are properly recovered. And again, once you become overtrained, then you've basically gone over the cliff and it's hard. You then have to do a lot of uh, resting to undo the damage that's been done, and that's counterproductive. So, at the very least, I would say it is um, it's prudent to do that because there's really no downside. You don't need to train balls to the wall every week, uh, 365 days, or, or let's say 52 weeks out of the year. You uh, having deload periods are not going to impair your results, and they very well can enhance them. So that's a good risk reward, in my opinion. Everything in, 
well, most things in life are risk reward. What's the or cost benefit? What is the cost? What's the benefit? You're not going to really have any risk of doing it. It's not going to set back your progress and very well could enhance it. It's kind of a no brainer. How often to do the deloads? That's a uh, subjective question. Again, it will depend upon the person. Usually somewhere every four to six weeks is kind of a gauge I, I usually use. And that tends to fit well for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of always view it as if you don't need to deload, then maybe you aren't ever training hard enough. And we know, especially as you advance, and I've noticed this, to actually see improvements, you really have to stress the body to quite a, you have to almost push, you don't push over the cliff, but you get very close to it. Right. And if you stay too far away, you're just going to end up kind of maintaining that same physique. You're not providing enough of a stress to disrupt homeostasis and progress. That's it. I think a lot of trainees kind of, especially when you start out, you probably don't need those deloads as often, but as we get more, and like, especially advanced trainees who are using more volume, they're using heavier loads, these kind of wear and tear things add up. Is there ever a time you think there's kind of active recovery phases, I mean, for bodybuilders? Yeah, so uh, generally when you say active recovery, you're talking about no training whatsoever. So usually I put in an active recovery phase after a super compensation phase where really, usually that's a very high volume phase that I use towards an end of a peaking uh, phase of, of a either competition or where someone's looking to really maximize the peak within a given outcome. And uh, that's where usually you should be pretty much spent at the end. And then I usually have a week, uh, depends on the person, but usually a week of active recovery where it's just doing very light. Uh, non-lifting based activities. There's no reason to lift at that point. Uh, often for bodybuilders, it's after the competition is over, like the week after they compete, uh, where their body is extremely depleted, also nutritionally as well. Um, obviously, that uh, that makes it very difficult to recover when you're not nutritionally supplemented properly. Uh, so anyway, th those are kind of, it's, it's a feeling out process, and that is my general uh, approach. Is it a hard, there's no, these are things that are not researched. There's no yeah. way to research anything like this. So this is where we need to be intuitive. We need to use logical reasoning to the best of our abilities or really it's the hierarchy of knowledge where scientific method is always our first default uh, choice, but we don't always have uh, proper research to go by. And in the absence of that, uh, we resort to logical reasoning and, and th uh, theoretical rationale based upon what we know. And just to make people feel okay about doing these deloads and these kind of active recovery periods, muscle is pretty easy to hold on to once you've got it, isn't it? Like you're not going to lose it within a week, are you? Yeah, this, the literature is quite clear that you do not lose anything, certainly muscle mass wise, in, in a couple of weeks. And usually strength, it takes more than a week to see any negative changes whatsoever. So uh, both, both musc markers of muscular adaptations really are not affected uh, during the week. And remember, that is with the complete detraining that I mentioned. So that's that would be through active recovery. It's not loss. Uh, with a deload, you're actually training. So you're, there is a stimulus that's being provided and there would be no uh, basis for, for losing anything that you have, losing any of your gains. Fantastic. And hopefully, I mean, this will be released around Christmas. So that'll make some people who are being a bit lazy and not being, or maybe not being able to get to the gym feel a bit better. Uh, so on a related note, because we've talked about obviously kind of this stepwise approach to building up volume and then obviously needing the deloads to recover, there's kind of a misconception about training to failure. And there's a lot of people, and I, I guess there are quite a lot of bodybuilders who may or may not be enhanced, who do train to failure a lot and all the time. Is that the, a good thing for a natural bodybuilder to do? What should we approach wise to training to failure? Is that required? So that's a topic that really is not well explored. Despite what people on both sides of the continuum preach, where some people say, ah, training to failure, you, know, you don't need to train to failure, and other people say that that really is the key to, uh, to optimal growth. Um, the literature is very, very lacking on it, and particularly in terms of the hypertrophic response. Strength, we have a little more data on it. Um, what, what I would say is, is that Again, this is where we have to pretty much default to logical rationale just because the types of studies that have been conducted, in my opinion, don't give us true insights into here. And uh, really, it's equivocal on both sides. Uh, I would say that um, 
Certainly training to failure all the time is not necessary and that it can be detrimental. It can be detrimental to uh, maintaining volume over time and also towards promoting overtraining. However, um, over short periods of time, that's not necessarily the case. So uh, can there be a potential benefit? Certainly there's a rationale where, as you kind of even mentioned before, that when you get to be very well trained, pushing your body beyond its limits, uh, basically it's a, uh, the adaptation, the body's adaptation is predicated on challenging it beyond its present state. Well, there's, it becomes much more difficult as you keep getting more advanced. So for an untrained person, they can probably get away with stopping a rep short of failure, a couple of reps short of failure, and seeing very, very robust gains, if not as good gains as they do train to failure. When you start getting more and more trained, at least through a theoretical standpoint, it would uh, it, it makes logical sense that at least sometimes going to failure will enhance uh, or at least promote a, an adaptive or, or a, a potential for an adaptive response, a greater potential. Um, so my kind of trying to put that together, uh, again, I, would, I do recommend a periodized approach to it where uh, you, do, you do use some, you, you have judicious use of training to failure, so you use it a little bit, and then maybe as you start getting towards a peaking phase, you start adding in somewhat more failure training. And as you mentioned, uh, things like lifestyle factors and certainly pharmacological enhancement, for lack of a better word, uh, can influence uh, how you would recuperate from something like that. So those are all things to keep in mind. I, my current philosophy at this point on the topic is that some failure training is beneficial and that too much is detrimental and there's a happy balance and that will be individual specific. Awesome. And I think just to kind of define failure, do you have a particular definition for it? I know I like Charles Poliquin, I think came up with it where it's kind of technical failure. So you don't go past, once you've broken your form, once you're not doing it properly, that's where you stop, that's failure. Do you have your own kind of individual definition for that? Yeah, so my general definition is the inability to uh, complete another repetition in proper form. Brilliant. Uh, so th I think there is um, some people who would consider fail what, what they going to failure for them is not uh, basically their body is twisted on their last rep, and I think that is they've taken it past the point of failure at that point. Yeah, I think they're going to destroy volume or any kind of training for a long time after that, so that's not a good idea. <laughs> So on another related note, where you've done a lot of research in kind of bodybuilder type splits versus, or not splits, but training repetitions versus kind of powerlifting ones. And the fact that maybe that traditional specific hypertrophy rep range isn't a necessary component for people trying to grow muscle in that you can grow muscle with these lower repetitions. Do you want to go over that research a little bit and just what you, what the conclusions you've come to from that? Yeah, so um, I've done a lot of work now with different rep ranges, and I actually have some more work that's going to be coming out, uh, which I can't uh, discuss at this point, but maybe at a future time I'll, yeah. I can get into that, which has some interesting connotations. But yeah, the uh, contrary to what I had thought coming into being a researcher educator and before I started carrying this out, is that hypertrophy is... You can get robust hypertrophy at really all ends of the uh, repetition continuum. So everything from very low reps to uh, very high reps. I mean, uh, we've in my lab, we've uh, looked at 30 reps plus uh, and shown robust hypertrophy in well-trained subjects and nice. resistance-trained men at that level. Um, now, at the low to moderate ranges, I actually have a study that just came out. Uh, which showed that equal number of sets, so when sets are equated, a three rep, so basically we looked at two to four reps, average of three reps, and eight to 12, so average of 10 reps. Uh, when it's equated by sets, so three sets of three versus three sets of 10, you get greater hypertrophy in the higher and the moderate rep yep. protocol. But I had another study that showed that when you equated based on volume load, meaning that the total amount of, of work done within the session was equated, and that was seven sets of three versus three sets of 10, there was roughly equal hypertrophy between the conditions. And what that tells me is that from a hypertrophy standpoint, um, and, and look, more work needs to be done on this, 
But at least uh, preliminarily based on the research, I would say that volume load is really a, an important driver of the hypertrophic response, particularly in the mod low to moderate rep range. It's difficult to know. We haven't carried that out in the higher reps, let's mm -hmm. say 20 plus. Certainly in the low to moderate rep ranges, uh, if you equate the volume load, now you have to do a lot more sets, thus with the achieve that, but you can certainly get robust hypertrophy uh, that uh, at least comes closer, if not uh, equals that of moderate rep training, assuming that you do the more sets. What I will also say is that to equate that, to equate the volume load, really takes a toll on your body over time. So it's difficult to achieve that volume. Certainly, it's much more efficient to do it uh, with the moderate rep ranges. And that's why I would say a hypertrophy range of the 6 to 12, at least in opposition to the lower rep ranges, is a more appropriate way to go about it for most people for, who are looking to uh, maximize growth simply because it's more efficient and less taxing on the, the joints and the uh, bodily systems. Uh, in the study that I had where we equated volume load, the uh, low rep group was toast by the time they finished their workouts. Really, all of them were starting to display signs of overtraining. And I know if we kept, uh, certainly it would be my, um, I would highly speculate, if we kept going with that study, it was eight weeks. If we took that to 12 weeks, they would have either dropped out or their performance would have really started to go off. Mm -hmm. So it's more not the fact that there's certain special reps that give hypertrophy, more so the fact those that rep range is an effective rep range for achieving a good amount of volume and a good amount of intensity to give that nice hypertrophic response. Yeah, now that's talking about global hypertrophy, so the actual whole muscle hypertrophy. I also have, uh, there's some good research from uh, Russia and I'm involved in a uh, in a regression analysis on this topic, which does show, uh, certainly gives insights that there might be a fiber type specific response, particularly between the higher rep when we start getting like 50% uh, one RM and below, so 20 reps plus versus 10 reps and below. When we're talking about the lower moderate, low to moderate versus the high reps, that you might see more. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's one versus the other. It's not binary. So certainly even very uh, high repetitions, you're going to get type 2 fiber development. But it does seem that the higher reps seem to target the type 1s to a greater degree and the low to moderate reps seem to target the type 2 fibers to a greater degree. And that would suggest that for maximal hypertrophy, you want to combine, you want to have some higher rep work in, so 20 plus, uh, type of uh, reps, certainly 15 plus, and then some 10 minus. Mm -hmm. And with that 20 plus training, I know I remember reading in the Max Muscle Plan that your like a hypothesis at the time was the reason bodybuilders are often bigger than powerlifters is because powerlifters don't tend to use these high repetition rep ranges, so they're not really getting maximal hypertrophy of these type 2 muscle fibers. Type 1 fibers. Type 1, sorry. <laughs> I always get those ones confused. I'm like, 2 must be slow. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when you're talking about the the 20 plus rep sets, is that to do with the metabolite buildup? Is there much information we've got on that? Mechanistically, it's really not clear. Uh, I, I would tend to think not uh, related to the metabolite as far as the fiber type specific response. And certainly hypertrophy uh, might have, uh, there's some good evidence that metabolite accumulation does induce hypertrophy. Uh, but as far as the specifics, mechanistic reasons for type 1, type 2 is not clear. Uh, we have speculated, myself and some of my other colleagues that have been involved in this research, have speculated that it just might be due to keeping the um, type 1 fibers under tension for longer periods of time. And since they're endurance-based fibers, that that might uh, spark them to have greater growth. Cool. And now I want to move on to something that I think a lot of people have heard of is bro splits or traditional splits where we're only hitting muscle groups maybe once a week or some muscle groups, believe it or not, the bros might not have known they were hitting multiple times because of kind of the fact different kind of exercises hit different muscle groups. But yeah, the traditional kind of bro splits versus higher frequency training now and there's a lot of kind of high frequency studies coming out, maybe not so much towards like bodybuilding specific, specific training, but I know you've had a meta-analysis recently that came out that came to some great conclusions about that. Yeah, so um, 
the traditional, it was interesting, a recent uh, survey of bodybuilders, 127 competitive bodybuilders, showed that uh, 127 out of 127 did a split routine. So there were no total body routines and that the most that any of the bodybuilders trained their muscles were twice a week. And as you mentioned, when we talk about that, there is overlap between some of the exercises. So a lat pull down is actually also working the sternal head of the pectoralis major as well as a seated row is. So people, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, certainly your arm muscles are going to get, when you're doing lat pull downs, you're working your biceps. I think most people do know that, but if you're doing your back and biceps on different days, even if you're saying you're training them once a week, you're really training the biceps more frequently. So, so that needs to be taken into account. Um, what I would say is, is that uh, the, we carried out a study and trained men, and it pretty clearly showed that doing a total body routine uh, had greater effects on muscle growth than doing the same equated volume on a split routine basis. Now, what I would say to that, uh, in opposition, I, I always look to critique my own studies. So we, we have to, each study begets another study. One of the benefits of a split routine is that you can get more volume in per muscle group. We intentionally wanted to equate that so that wasn't a confounding factor. Mm -hmm. If we had, a, had the volumes being different, which would have been more what's called ecologically valid, meaning that it's more consistent with how people train, we would have then lost the control factor and people would have said, well, now how do we know it's the, frequency, the volume and not the frequency? So when you do one study and that begets another study, and I'm actually now collaborating on another study that will look at that. Uh, so again, you have to do one before you do the next. But what I'll say is, is that um, it did show greater effects of training more frequently. So that when we split it up, and that would refute the um, contention that you should be doing these bro splits where you do a back day and then a chest day and a shoulder day. Um, but again, that's without looking at the volume factor. Uh, we, our meta analysis uh, pretty clearly showed that two sets or more were better than, uh, no, I'm sorry, two, two days a week or more were better than just one day a week per muscle. Uh, we were not able to get any, uh, there wasn't enough data to show whether three or four or five might have been even better than that. Um, but again, these were over short term, short time periods, which you have to remember. Also, could there be benefits towards periodizing these? That's one of the things that we often don't look at in research. Uh, or often when we say don't look at, when, that when we're evaluating a research study that it's not taken into account. And it's very important to remember that over short time periods, the body can recuperate a lot better. Even when you're pushing yourself towards overtraining, you don't necessarily see the overtrain response taking effect in eight weeks uh, at the levels that we're doing it. So if you keep doing that over the course of six months, eight months a year, could there be different effects, negative effects? Those are things that we can't tell from the research, and that's why your N equals 1 has to come in. But what I would say clearly from the research is that periods of higher frequency training seem to be effective. And that also kind of fits in with the model of the acute response uh, to protein synthesis, uh, whereby the body, after a training session, the body is max, uh, protein synthesis is optimized for about 48 hours or so. So having more multiple uh, multiple sessions per week of the hitting that muscle might create a greater stimulus. And I guess something that's interesting in that as well is those uh, bodybuilders that you talked about that were surveyed, I guess they're not also the research subjects. So they're quite different in terms of that. They're probably a, a lot stronger and bigger, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. Now, the, my, again, my subjects in the study I had were pretty jacked. We have okay. they call my, my university jacked you, but uh, they were trained subjects, so they, they certainly weren't. Well, some of them actually were looked like or, or had bodybuilding type of builds. Well, they, none of them were competitive bodybuilders at the time. Uh, but, I, I mean, we get some good subjects, and look, there are some that are less than that year when you have a, what's called trained men, uh, and you have your criteria at one year, uh, training three days a week. Some of them might be one year, three days a week. Some of them might be eight years, three days a week, or five days a week, or six days a week. And uh, there will be a wide spectrum there. So, uh, yeah, what I would say too is that people that um, trash on the bro splits, bodybuilders are pretty jacked. So, yeah. you know, what, we're, what my job is to try to optimize results. Uh, you certainly can get results, can and do get results training on a bro split. 
you just have to take a look at the competitive bodybuilders to see that. I guess maybe they could be more jacked, but that would just be scary. (laughs) And that's right. That's where it comes down to is that just, and really that's what we have to look at. You can't just, so on the other hand, you can't just say, well, bodybuilders do that. So that must be the best way to train because they're getting good results. Could they be getting better results? And that's why we have to keep trying to push the science forward uh, to to come up with these evidence-based recommendations and within that, like I said, there's a lot of leeway towards individualizing it. And you talked about periodizing maybe periods of lower frequency versus higher frequency. And is that, do you think that even keeping volume level, that would have a positive impact on just training the muscle groups more frequently? Tough to say. I mean, that's a hypothesis. I like to use greater frequency of training to uh, modulate volume. Uh, so if you basically, because there also is a point where if you're training hard within a given session, if you're doing a three-hour session, it's really hard to sustain your intensity level over that time. And that, to me, the quality of training starts to degrade after 60 to 90 minutes of, of a real intense workout, a good workout. Um, so rather than trying to extend the workout to increase volume, really the best way to do it would be through greater frequency. Mm-hmm. And actually, that's it's interesting you bring that up. I've recently experiment. Well, I'm experimenting recently doing AM and PM style workouts. So uh, one earlier in the day, one later in the day. And it's certainly, I mean, you're in and out of the gym a lot quicker, but you can actually stay focused. So for things like my abs, my calves, things I normally am like, uh, I, I don't normally go very intense if I do end up doing them. Whereas now I can be fully focused. And I guess yeah, splitting up. It, like even just through the week from going from full body to maybe splitting up into an upper lower and this is something i guess people have looked at and shown that as you advance is a good idea to split it up a little bit more very little research on that topic there's been a couple studies that were conducted uh, one showed benefit but they were and one didn't they're very short term a few weeks uh, th- three weeks i believe which is hard to really get uh any clue and any good uh evidence from brilliant well, I think we have covered a hell of a lot in a short period of time and actually got a really comprehensive view of the current literature, the current state of hypertrophy kind of science and where we are. And I find it all very fascinating. I think the work you're doing for the industry, for the guys that are trying to get jacked is amazing. And every single study that comes out from you, I'm like on, my, on the edge of my seat trying to see what's coming out because if we can get any more gains, we want those gains. Uh, so I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me today and just i think everyone would say as well just thank you for everything you're doing for the industry because it's a massive 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 thing for us my my pleasure steve anytime cheers brad and thank you everyone for tuning in if you haven't reviewed the podcast yet please do this is my sneaky plug at the end of this and take care thank you